But now it is time to introduce very briefly Antti Lampinen, our main actor tonight. Antti received his doctorate from the University of Turku uh, in 2013 with a thesis on representations of northern people's religious traditions in the greek roman ethnographical tradition. Subsequently, he held a research fellowship at the University of St. Andrews, as well as in Helsinki. Since already now, uh, from 2018, Antti has worked at the Finnish Institute at Athens as our assistant director, and he is a very, very highly valued member of our staff. His research interests include many interesting fields and, the and, and thematics. For instance, ancient ethnography and geography and their reception, perceptions and representations of outrageous and subalterns in antiquity, and ancient divina uh, divination. So just to mention a few, uh, few amongst his interesting research interests. Recently, Antti has published on themes such as ancient physiognomy during the second sophistic, oracular and grammatical hermeneutics, and the representations of foreign people's divination practices in imperial era literature. He is cu currently editing even two uh, uh, collected, uh, co, co editing two collected volumes. This is now my joy and pleasure to welcome you, Antti, uh, to, to the stage. So, please. Thank you ever so much, Petra, for these lovely words of uh, welcome from downstairs of the Institute here to the upstairs. And thank you also very much for contextualizing Aristophanes for us, uh, not only extremely apt and topical reflections, but also I find something that saves me personally lots of time today from contextualizing Aristophanes again. Um, I think I will now quite simply share the screen and indeed start the, start the slideshow. Comedy, as Petra was pointing out, has often been put forward as a genre of ancient writing where we may, in some topics and subjects, be able to get closer to the broader pace, base of popular opinion than in some other, more clearly elite-centered kinds of writing. Mm, this does not, however, apply to all kinds of comedy, such as mm, later, more literary ones, or indeed, it doesn't apply to all kinds of elite writing either. Yet in terms of old comedy, the comic plays as written by Aristophanes and his predecessors during the classical era, this characterization feels quite apt. The comedies of this period were, of course, subject to some conventions stemming from their genre, but they were in constant interaction with the opinion and worldviews of a fairly well-known set of contemporary freeborn audiences. Today, I would like to kick our series off by having a look at Aristophanes' ways of using ethnic categories and stereotypes as a material for his comedy, with a full recognition that this is a topic which, perhaps out of Aristophanes' thematics, thematics with which, which we might choose to view Aristophanes, may have dated particularly badly due to modern sensibilities. So this is a caveat, naturally. And indeed, it feels like I should perhaps start with a few words about the terminology used in the title of this lecture, meaning mostly race and ethnicity. Now, the term race is necessarily a modern concept, and its applicability to ancient contexts has been much debated. Um, recently, Denise Eileen McCoskey has pointed out that using race when debating ancient perceptions of human groups may not be more anachronistic than the use of several other modern quite useful back-projected concepts, and may be justified due to the existence in antiquity of a powerful set of theories and epistemic structures that made certain groups of foreign peoples seem, in the eyes of the ancient observers, more fundamentally different from the Greeks than Greeks were from each other. Naturally, to use a race in this sense does not in any way imply any belief that such things have any actual existence in the real world, outside the cultural categories and discourse of ancient societies. The use of the word race ties also to the concept of racism, the application of which to the ancient context has similarly been a much discussed heuristic choice. The same caveats apply, more or less, 
although there was no such concept in antiquity, this does not automatically mean that thought patterns and causative arguments coming close enough to the modern understanding of racism could not be identified in ancient sources. Benjamin Isaac famously wrote in 2004 an influential and much debated book, The Invention of Racism in Classical Antiquity. Although he too subsequently has moved largely onto speaking about proto-racism, in recognition of the epistemic differences between ancient racialized thinking and pre-modern and modern scientific racism. But even in antiquity, the defining of a foreign group as essentially different uh, usually led to value statements and what is usually called othering. Ethnicity is perhaps a less problematic category than race, but not without its pitfalls. In the Herodotian view, language is the principal denominator of human group identities. He says this famously about the Hellenes, but also attributes similar views to the Egyptians. People such as Scythians could be called in Herodotus' histories interchangeably either ethnos or genos. Indeed, both ethnos and genos are frequently translated into English with terms that make them ethnic groupings. But this by no means exhausts the meaning of these words in ancient Greek. Genos, for instance, could denote any group with a perceived hereditary connection, but also species of animals. It always seems to contain an assumption of common genealogy. While ethnos may have this, it does not have to have it. Since Aristophanes' plays are generally quite a useful source for their contemporary society in Attica, a window into the lives and worldviews of classical Athenians, it may be sensible to start off from some of the components that defined the thinking of his Attic contemporaries about categories that we nowadays call race and ethnicity. In this section, I will discuss the Athenian worldviews components, which ranged in a series of ever more distant regions or zones from the familiarity and centrality of Attica to the furthest away Escartii of the world's fringes. Some further away areas could, however, be perceived as comparatively more important or familiar than the rest due to political, economical or other interests. One point we should bear in mind when speaking about the barbarians and more generally others in Aristophanic comedy is that in addition to representing the Hellenocentric worldviews of their audiences, these texts are also extremely Athenocentric. Thus, many of the aspects, even in terms of ethnic imagery, cannot necessarily be expanded to cover other classical era Greek-speaking societies, and even less Greeks as a whole, whatever we might understand by that word at the context. By the time Aristophanes' career had taken off, it had become almost a commonplace in Athenian self-representation that they were autochthonous meaning that they were literally sprung from the earth of Attica itself through their earliest ancestors, Kekrops and Erechtheus, without any later intermixture or migrations. Herodotus refers uh, to Athenian speech containing the sentence, we Athenians, the most ancient people in Greece, the only Greeks who have never migrated. This was a significant and influential propagandistic motif, and although other Greek polities gestured occasionally towards similar arguments, it was only Athens that made it such a crucial strut to its projection of power among the Greek states. In the aftermath of the Persian Wars, the, and I quote here Susan Lape, you will find this in the bibliography in the last slide, the myth of autochthony became the founding fiction of democratic citizen identity, partly because it offered such a useful identity narrative. This helped to define Athenians from other Greeks and to explain their special role in defending Hellas against the Persians. In fact, Aristophanes echoes these ideas about autochthony, for instance, in his Wasps, the passage I'm quoting on the slide. We who wear this appendage, meaning the sting at the end, are the true Attic men, who alone are noble and native to the soil, the bravest of all people. We are the ones who, weapon in hand, did so much to the country when the barbarians shed torrents of fire and smoke over our city in his relentless desire to seize our nest by force. But this wasn't just the swagger of soldiers either. This was the attitude of the citizen hoplites after decades of sustained expounding of Periclean nativist ideology. In Aristophanes' era, Athenian citizenship was by default a genealogical distinction based on genos and defined in a way that was downright nativistic. 
in a fairly recent study, this is Susanna Lape, the conception of Athenian citizen identity has even, has even been called racial with some justification, namely the genealogical connection or the insistence on genealogical connection. The mythologies of Athenian autochthony had, in any case, inspired legislative measures and then been reified by them in turn. Pericles' citizenship laws, legislated in 451 and 450, mandated that only those born to two citizen parents could themselves be Athenian citizens. The ancestry of each member of a fratry would be ascertained whenever they tried to enroll their sons as a citizen or recognized their daughter, who of course has no citizen rights in Athens. In Thucydides' rendering, the Periclean measures were distinguished for being comparatively lenient since foreigners were not actively expelled from Attica, but this seems like special pleading. In practical terms, this meant that even Pericles' own son by Aspasia had to be later retroactively made a citizen in a special procedure after Pericles' two older sons from an earlier wife had died. But what is equally important is that the nativistic conception of citizenship was very much a characteristic of the Athenian democratic rule. After the 30 tyrants relaxed the definition of legitimate offspring eligible for citizenship, the refoundation of the democracy brought with it a return to the old hyper-narrow genealogical definition. Uh, people who could be plausibly argued to have been born out of mixed marriages and whose legitimacy as citizens came thus under question faced strong pressures and shame. And as famines became more common during the Peloponnesian Wars and suspicion towards Metics and Xenoi grew, non-citizens could be shut outside grain distribution and would have felt a hardening of attitudes. It is well known that in old comedy, accusations or insinuations of illegitimacy were a common but serious category of attacks. They could be particularly fruitful against opponents from non-aristocratic backgrounds whose family pedigree could be argued to have something murky in the past few generations. So the nativistic citizen policies of classical Athens were a major source of exclusion. In a more macroscopic view, the Athenian Empire, which Aristophanes himself, with a bit of exaggeration, uh, could say to have spread during the Pentecon Taitia or the 50-year period, the height of, height of Athenian power, could be argued to have stretched from Pontus to Sardinia, you see it in this map, um, of course, quite an exaggeration, the Sardinia part, especially from Aristophanes. But on the other hand, in his early play, The Babylonians, which Petra already mentioned, very successful at City Dionysia, but nowadays unfortunately lost, Aristophanes did cause a bit of scandal by comparing the member states of the Delian League to slaves working on a mill. The mill was naturally grinding well for Athens. Now, the problem was that many delegates from said member states were present in the audience not thrilled, I'm sure. Petra will later be speaking much more in her talk about Aristophanes' rivalry with Cleon, but it may be that the exacerbation of the relations first stems partly at least from the backlash uh, to the Babylonians. As the name of the play, Babylonians, testifies, using faraway peoples to speak about everyday problems and dynamics at home was a very well-established literary and pole polemic technique. And judging by the titles of otherwise vanished plays, it is in fact seems to be becoming more common during the middle comedy after Aristophanes' lifetime. Especially in the field of comedy, disguising your most inflammatory barbs into the guise of allegories, other localizations or mythological references was occasionally necessary as a way for maintaining deniability from the playwright's part. We know that many other comic playwrights, both before and after Aristophanes' time, wrote comedies with names referring to foreigners. We know of Lydians by Magnes, two comedies called Persians by Epicarmus and Perecrates, respectively, uh, and later also of Carians by Antiphanes and Scythians by Xenarchos. One of the major theoretical structures that influenced the ways in which classical Athenians conceptualized foreign population groups was climatic or environmental determinism. The thought that the climates and environments influenced fundamentally and essentially the qualities of the peoples living in them. One of the earliest and most famous texts stemming uh, from this way of thinking, the Hippocratic text on airs, waters, places, tried to explain the ethnically articulated differences between world's populations and the characteristics of different peoples as the result of their environments. Things such as 
Asia differs very much from Europe in the nature of everything that grows the vegetable or human. Everything grows much bigger and finer in Asia because the nature of the land is tamer, the character of the inhabitants is milder and less passionate. And this is said to derive from the equable blending of the climate, Asia being largely removed from extremes of heat and cold. Overall, however, the Hippocratic Treats ends up endorsing a mixed causation stemming from both feces, nature, and normals, nurture, in its desire to harmonize and explain the received already circulating stereotypes about Northerners and Easterners. The Greeks of Asia Minor, for instance, are included within the broader Asian or Asiatic characteristics, since the region of Asia Minor, both in character and mildness of its seasons, could be compared to spring. Courage, endurance, industry, and high spirit could not arise in such conditions, either among the natives or among immigrants, but pleasure must be supreme. No doubt this was motivated as an explanation to account for the way in which the Greek cities of Asia Minor had come under the Persian rule, while the mainlanders had by and large resisted it. Peoples of Europe, according to the Hippocratic author, differ from the dwellers of Asia on account of the more savage changes of weather in the region. This is argued to introduce differences between the ethne and lead to more harsh and tenacious character overall. So, indeed, the chief reason why Asiatics are less warlike and gentler in character than Europeans is the uniformity of their seasons, which shows no violent changes either towards heat or towards cold, but are equable. Their institutions are a contributory cause, the greater part of Asia being governed by kings. So here comes the nomic explanation as well. All the inhabitants of Asia, whether Greek or non-Greek, who are not ruled by despots but are independent, toiling for their own advantage, are the most warlike of all men. So it is in fact a confusing as assemblage of exceptions, and the difficulty is that the author of Airs Waters Places gets in order to accommodate all the ethnicizing judgments and to explain them through a macro paradigm, have been commented by, by many scholars, including Charles Chasson. Within the broader pattern, the mainland Greeks are distinguished by the otherwise beneficial effects of their climate. But other Europeans, such as the Farsians in the eastern Pontic coast or the Scythians, suffer from the extremes of moisture and overly cool temperatures. They, they develop all sorts of pathologizing ethnic characteristics. Climate is hence not the only explanatory factor. The Hippocratic author echoes the talking points of his own era regarding the effect that freedom or slavery had over different people's customs and declares that the Asian people's feebleness is exacerbated by them being ruled autocratically on the last line of this slide, for instance. In the realm of theoretical and conceptual treatises, another significant angle to the Athenian discourse on ethnicized perceptions comes from the sophistic movement, and especially from the text known as Dissoi Loboi, or Opposing Arguments, probably written at the end of the fifth century and thus contemporary to Aristophanes an interesting counterpoint in many ways. Uh, the text ex explores opposing arguments on a variety of topics with the overall effect being an emphasis on the relativity of cultural values and norms very much in the way that Protagoras had argued. So for instance, Thracians adorn themselves with the tattoos, but among every other pe uh, people, they are punishment for wrongdoers. The Scythians scalp their enemies and drink from their scars uh, among Greeks, no one would want to go into the same house as a person who had done that sort of thing. The Masagetai famously uh, bury their parents by eating them. If a person did this in Greece, he would be driven out of Greece and die a miserable death for doing things that are shameful and horrible. Similarly, Persians are described as adorning themselves like women and to have sexual intercourse with their daughters or mothers or sisters, whereas Greeks consider such actions shameful and unlawful. Now, it comes fairly clear very fast that in these listings of ethnic customs, despite the overarching argument about relativity, uh, the barbarian peoples tend to be the ones who are presented as the practitioners of gruesome practices, and these are contrasted with the Greek lack of similar customs. In very few cases only is the comparative eye turned to highlight Greek customs, which would be shameful to the barbarians. The general feeling of Greco-centricism is thus maintained on the level of knowledge ordering. Another noteworthy aspect of such listings is their foregrounding of what's co being called the ethnographic omniscience. 
and lack of granularity about the non-Greek groups. All Masagetai, all Thracians, or all Scythians are categorically set to practice a given custom, and no exceptions are brooked. Among the Greek ethne, on the other hand, and as well as Greek regional groupings, much variation is noted. There are some physical objects which seem to bear a similarity to this racialized relativism of the Dissoi Logoi. Most prominently, the examples from sympotic paraphernalia, such as pottery and metal dishes, which feature strongly distinguished physiognomies. We should, however, be somewhat careful in extrapolating ethnically framed perceptions from comparatively elite-centered cultural activities, such as sophistic rhetoric or sympotic conversation topics, to apply to the broader echelons of the Athenian society, such as was addressed probably by Aristophanes. No doubt some of these perceptions were indeed commonly shared by the population, but the relativistic world of this soil ogoi, where every custom was pointed out to be acceptable in some part of the world, uh, might necessarily not have chimed in with the general audience of Aristophanes. As we will see below, his references to ethnic practices are generalized and do not attempt to argue for their normativization in their own context. As we will see also later, Aristophanic comedy relied on pre-existing stereotypes and ideas for comedic effect. This is, of course, typical to comedy in general, in the sense that triggering images and beliefs that the audience already holds is the secret to both turning these beliefs onto their heads for comedic effect, or indeed a much simpler comedic act of poking fun on insufficiencies, idiosyncrasies, strange things, and other aspects of population groups. These were not always ethnic groups, of course, but frequently ethnically framed targets were part of the set of stereotypes that comedy used. Ethnographical and geographical knowledge commonly went hand in hand in the ancient popular perceptions and even more theoretical knowledge formation structures, such as we saw in the preceding slides. Regions were, as we discussed, populated by people who were often thought to have been shaped into what they were by either environmental influences their cultural or social practices, or a combination of the two. Out of these two explanation models, the normoi or customs were vastly more useful as a comedic material. On the other hand, ethnographic change was not often envisioned. People in certain regions were frequently perceived as staying always the same, and the same areas giving in turn rise to the same kind of peoples over and over again. The clearest case of dynamics through which faraway areas could become familiar to Athenian audiences were those stemming from economical or political interests. Often these were also given a mythological precedent or other forms of legitimation. In the minds of Aristophanes' Athenian contemporaries, the distinction between Greeks and non-Greek barbarians was clear-cut, and practically no trace of the relativism of Herodotus or Dissoilogo is to be found in old comedy. This is quite important, I find. Um, but although barbarians could never be Hellens, certain barbarian regions were better known and better understood than others. Let's take an example from the Persian Empire. And the, in terms of the Persians, although any immediate danger of invasion seemed to have been lifted from the minds of Aristophanes' contemporaries, the wealth, the vast manpower, and the pervasive influence of the Persian realm was felt as an oppressive presence in Athenian strategizing, even during the Peloponnesian Wars. The Greek reaction to the victory in the Persian Wars had taken also comedic forms, as we can see from the fam famous uh, Eurymedon vase, which, according to the most interpreters, seems linked to the Greek naval victory over Persians in the early 460s BC at the Eurymedon River. With its technique of making the figure of the broadly oriental Persian or Scythian interpretations differ in this, Archer a fearful, comic, and passive recipient of an impending rape by the striding Greek, the fear of the superpower was partly relieved through humor and feelings of superiority. Even fairly far-flung ideas could be relied to be at least broadly known to the Aristophanic audience. They knew, for instance, that Caria and Carthage were in two different directions. Similar juxtaposition of geographical place names from the opposite edges of the world is invoked in clouds, where like Lake Maiotis, the modern uh, Sea of Azov, and the Nile are contrasted. Of course, imagery such as this imply that the speaker and by extension Athenians themselves were in the center of the Oikumene, the inhabited world. Mythological connections also could form axes of familiarity and tie Athens to certain regions outside Attica. 
Delos was one such case among the close by regions. But as Renaud Gagné has recently demonstrated very eloquently, much more far flung axes of familiarity connected Athens to the regions of Thrace, the northern Pontic region, where much of its grain came from, and even far beyond the fringes of the actually experienced world. The mythical people of the Hyperboreans were the furthest away echo of the Athenians' own special place in the world, and were thought to have had numerous connections to the Athenian orbit. Scythians and Thracians had loomed large in the Athenians' view of foreign lands, at least since Herodotus's time, but other regions that featured importantly in Herodotus' history, such as Egypt, remained comparatively more peripheral to the Athenian interests, judging by Aristophanes in this case. So although Aristophanes was born well after the Persian Wars and indeed grew up in the later half of the Athenian Golden Age, non-Greek areas would have been in many ways in the minds of these audiences. His own view of non-Greek groups would also have been shaped by a number of different contacts. The period of the Peloponnesian Wars saw Athens engaging its enemies and their allies in a number of different fields and both using and facing barbarian mercenaries. The Persian Empire got extensively involved in the inter-Greek warfare and these warlike years characterized the best part of our state. Diplomatic missions, long distance merchants and mercenary contracts all played their part in, in informing the classical Athenians about foreign lands and their peoples. All these types of contract, contacts are present in the sidelines of Aristotelian comedies. For most Athenians, however, the most common modes of forming ethnicized or ethnically framed knowledge were much more everyday. Slavery, of course, was the most important of these. Slaves were frequently renamed by the Athenian owners. Here we have some of the most typical slaving areas for Athenian slaves, reflecting that Black Sea axis, which was very important for Athenian long-term strategy. So slaves were frequently renamed by the Athenian owners, thus in many cases eradicating a fundamental marker of their previous lives and identities. This was sometimes replaced by an ethnic slave name, often very cliché indicating their origin. In, only, only in Aristophanes we have, for instance, a Phrygian Manes and Mania, the female form, as well as Midas and simply Phrux from the same region. In uh, Thesmophoriatsus we have a Thraita, the feminine of, uh, of Thracian, and in the Sistrata we of course have Scythina, the female Scythian. In comedies, barbarian names are frequently used in a stereotypical way, such as when in frogs, the barbarian henchmen of Ayakos are called Titulas, Kebluas, and Pardokas. Their names evoke one group of slaves who were very visible in the public space in the 5th and perhaps still in the 4th centuries of Athens, the Scythian archers who functioned as a sort of police force in Athens, but more of them uh, also later. But this presence in the city of the Scythian archers was a very tangible and visible sign of Athens's connections to the Pontic world of the north, where the main imports were grain and slaves. The Scythian archers were slaves of the police herself, commanded by the Prytans, and um, were in charge of keeping order in the courts and public spaces, but first and foremost on the assembly on Pnus. In Aristophanic comedy, the role, they almost always play the role of dim-witted adversary, technically representative of the coercive power of the state, but in fact slaves also to their own base barbarian urges, as well as very easily provoked into using their whips. The often seen Scythians of the Athenian vase paintings are not, however, necessarily very closely linked with the police force, since this uh, imagery had reached, reached its peak of popularity in the late Paisistrative era, late 6th century, as Paulina Bebler has noted. Just like comedic plays could draw the far-flung corners of the world to the confines of the theatre at the moment of performance, so could the far-flung ethnicities of the world be called to the presence of the Athenian audience. Ethnic stereotypes did not necessarily need to be only verbally referred to. We know that some Aristophanic plays did include acting parts for barbarian characters, such as Triballos, more of whom in a moment. But most ethnic references could be understood even without the audience seeing a visibly barbarian or non-Greek character. Their shared knowledge pool and stereotypes made sure that when an ethnoname, meaning the name of a population group, was mentioned, a series of predictable cliches and characteristics was activated in their minds. A good example of the instant triggering of already existing ethnic stereotypes is the way in which, in the nights, the populist politician Cleon is referred to simply as Paphlagonian, 
which relies on the ethnic stereotypes about Paphagonians. They were thought to be working mostly in menial tasks. And from the imperial era, from Lucian satire, Alexander the Fourth prophet, we have the idea of roughly short peasant Paphagonians, very superstitious and smelling of garlic. They were also a fairly common group among household slaves, though not as common as Phrygians and Thracians, or indeed Carians, who already in Kratinos' place were thought about thought as being completely expendable, sort of human guinea pigs. Um, a collector of proverbs called Diogenianus seems to have said, Lydians are bad, Egyptians are worse, but Carians are the worst of all. All these groups did, however, have easily triggered stereotypes associated with them. Lydians were often lambasted as sexually insatiable, Phrygians as utterly timid, whereas the Thracians were commonly assumed to be unteachable and downright stupid. In what follows, I will broadly divide the sets of Athenian stereotypes into two macro groups, the European or broadly northern population groups and the Asiatic peoples, who in terms of broad stereotypes often included groups from both east and the south. The continent of Africa, called Libya by the Greeks, was quite commonly considered to belong to Asia. There was either a two-continent model or a three-continent model. The three-continent model usually tended to draw the limit of Asia and Libya on the River Nile, thus splitting Egypt to straddle two continents. Thrace, as I mentioned already earlier, was a very well-known area to the Athenians. Indeed, it may well have been the best-known near-abroad area where many Athenian families had mining interests or timber business, and several colonies and clerukies of Athenians had been sent to the area over the centuries. Thrace, although it was such an economically important area to Athens, was frequently thought of as a wild and rather savage land, very much the opposite of Attic familiarity. In Acarnians, it could also be a wintry obstacle to travel. The ethnography of the region focused, on the one hand, on the perceived huge numbers of Thracians as a whole, and on the other hand, on the very low civilizational level of most Thracian groups, as well as their bizarre religious rituals and beliefs. On the other hand, Thracians were, from at least Herodotus' histories onwards, known by the Greeks to sell their own children to slavery. Tom Harrison has recently pointed out in an excellent article that this no doubt made it easier for the Greeks to tell themselves that Thracians were born to be enslaved, uh, natural slaves, as, if it, as it were. Explanations which can be compared with those that were frequently aired in the pre-emancipation southern United States. Again, in the Acarnians, Thracian mercenaries from the group of Odomantes defined quite, quite interestingly as circumcised, this is not parallel in, everywhere, uh, in anywhere else, end up robbing the main character Dikaiopolis's garlic satchel. Outraged, Dikaiopolis demands whether the Pretans will allow him to be treated like that in my own country and by barbarians. Sort of slightly gammonish sentiment, if you ask me. Overall, the scene could have spoken to the average Athenians' uneasiness about the wider world infringing on their routine proceedings on the Pnyx. Both the Athenian ambassadors from Persia and from Thrace bring with them foreigners with dubious credentials who introduce disharmony and confusion. Both areas were, of course, of vital interest to Athenians, but there seems to have existed a strong undercurrent of suspicion and resentment towards the Athenian entanglement with the practicalities of having a two-way relationship with either, either of these foreign regions. As Timothy Long has noted several decades ago, the scene is remarkable because it brings together the two main axes of Athenian designs at this early part of the Peloponnesian War, especially the macro-political strategy of ensuring Persian support and financial help in order to pay for the mercenaries from the north. Aristophanes' hostility towards the Odomantes in particular may have had something to do with the fact that Cleon, his great personal enemy, his pet noir, had advocated for the use of these same Thracians as mercenaries. Indeed, the Odomantians had an important role to play in the Athenian success against the Spartans. At the Battle of Spacteria, that very year, Acarnians was performed in 425. In Aristophanes' birds, the barbarian god, Triballos, is presented as a conglomerate of many of the perceived barbarian characteristics of his Thracian people, the Triballoi, who were perhaps well known in Aristophanes' own context, especially due to the allied king, Sitalkes of the Odomantes, uh, having fallen in four, uh, 424, 10 years before the production of the play, in a battle against Triballoi, according to Thucydides. In the play itself, the successful blocking of 
of sacrificial nutrition, if you will, to the divinities, has led the gods of the barbarians to start threatening the Olympian gods with war. And hence, the god of the Tribalians is part of the delegation sent to negotiate with Pistet Iros, the, the main character of the play. But despite his identity as a supposed divinity, it is not exactly religion as such which is being parodied, but a generic form of non-Greekness. The image of Tribalos, as has been noted by many, is wholly negative and relied on a pre-established set of ideas about relations for its effect. He can barely pass together an understandable sentence. He is motivated by greed and impatient about that too. He cannot get a grip of his official Greek-style ambassador's himation. He is completely flabbergasted by it. He drapes it incorrectly, prompting Poseidon to call him an accursed savage and the most barbaric god he had ever seen. And also in a political jive to lament the state of the divine democracy that has voted such an inept ambassador to represent the gods. Triballos's own comedic effect is achieved mostly by his slapstick bumbling and the gibberish he speaks. It becomes clear that just like no one understands his answers, he has not understood anything of the proceedings either. Uh, even when Heracles asks whether he wants to be beaten, here you say, here you see Triballos' lines. It's uh, first Nabasatreu, then Saunaka Baktare Krusa. And in this translation, the last line, which is Kalani Korauna Kai Megala Basili Nau Ornito Paradidomi has been translated in this sort of half understandable English as given birth pretty Gelbigum queen. So rather sort of on the nose, anti-accentuated speech uh, representation or representation uh, of accent accentuated speech in a ridiculous form. But Aristophanes' tribalos may not be quite as simple as a case of just laughing at the uncultivated Thracians, although the northern peoples have been noted already by Herodotus to have been devoid of any kind of learning in histories 4.46. Uh, indeed, Aristophanic comedy has been noted to have picked up some of the ethnographical tropes that Herodotus had included, not only in this case, in many other cases as well. Tribalos' incom incomprehensible gibberish may have been this is a suggestion by Timothy Long, may have been intended as a comparable somehow to oracular speech, which was seen as proverbially impenetrable and which came under criticism from Aristophanes, among others, Euripides, of course, as well. If this is indeed the case, the Thracian direction could have been chosen due to the popularity of all kinds of religious freelance initiators, cult peddlers and presmologues who claimed a connection with Thrace, an area that had become well known for its connections to the Orpheus, Orphic and Mystery cults. The comic poet's hostility to most forms of religious obscurantism may here have been projected onto this Tribalian god. Birds also contains a reference to the further away northerners, the paradig paradigmatically nomadic Scythians. Overall, the place atti uh, this place attitude to exploring and comparing the customs of birds and humans resembles the form of topics of ethnographical literature. Even the format of this Zoologoi, I feel, is played with um, when the newly established Nephelokokkigia or cloud cuckoo lands laws emphasize that what is forbidden among the humans will be allowed uh, among the birds. The accommodating nature of the bird society in implicitly contrasts with the ethnic discrimination among Greeks. Proverbial representatives of ethnic failings, such as the Phrygian Spintharos or the Carian Exegestides, would be welcome among the birds. But this is not about Aristophanes advocating for a more tolerant society. The comedic effect seems to have rather depended on the carnivalistic reversal of expectations that the unrealistically idealized bird society would completely erase ethnic name tags from anybody joining them. Besides, these expectations are in fact reversed and frustrated in the end. Exegestides is included, uh, is sorry, excluded from this society too. As Timothy Long has observed, one of the main themes of the birds as a play is the exclusion of foreigners. Under the comparatively light-hearted veneer of the play, uh, what is in fact reinforced is the idea of any ancient polis obviously excluding some people, even if it was newly founded from scratch as Nephelokokkia is. Here, the stark limits to citizenship in Periclean and post-Periclean democratic Athens are brought to a clear relief. In Athens, the everyday realities for anybody standing out reflected this. 
many Aristophanic plays refer to barbarian accents and other non-Athenian ways of speaking, being openly mocked by different characters. Another group of northerners who were frequently mocked and depicted speaking broken Greek were the Scythian archers already mentioned, uh, the law enforcers of Athens, the police owned slaves. The best example is the Scythian guarding and torturing Mnesilochos in Thesmophoriatsusai, whose time is Euripides' attempt to release Mnesilochos by simply being too thick to understand Euripides' self-quotations. Euripides tries essentially this sort of almost like a meme type of strategy first. He tries to enact his own plays, narcissistic as he is. So while often the comic heroes outwit the dim Scythians, in this case, that very dimness poses challenges to convincing them. The Scythian guardsman is far too tight to the concrete for any kind of conceptual argument to have purchase on him. Euripides cannot replicate the exemplum of Odysseus and the Cyclops, and more broadly, uh, the Hellenic form of the inability of the Scythian to understand these references to theatre in a way affirm the role of theatre as a paradigmatically Hellenic form of cultural expression. It becomes clear that instead of clever arguments, it seems like a more solid plan to manipulate the Scythian through his barbarian weaknesses. Thus, a dancing girl, Artemisia, called by the policeman Artamuxia in his garbled Greek, is brought in to distract the Scythian, in whose nature physical lust triumphs over any sense of duty. But the fear of the Scythian here, though narrowly framed as the poor dancing girl's fear of the frankly quite rapey Scythian archer, the do you still fear the Scythian of my title, could of course be read as a broader question directed by Aristophanes at his audience. Are they still fearful of the police force, barbarians though they are, and clearly enjoyed the reputation for cruelty now that they've seen how inept, manipulable and stupid they were? Yet, among Aristophanes' few speaking roles for barbarians, this archer is at least among the more talkative ones. Edith Hall has noted that the Scythian archer of Thesmophoriadzusa is the Aristophanic barbarian character with the greatest amount of lines to say, and what he says is more comprehensible, but clearly marked as barbarian speech by recurring phonetic and syntactic errors. Hall also suggested that the way in which Artemisia became Artamuxia in the Scythian's mouth may conform with the Athenian audience's stereotypes about Scythian names. In Herodotus, a great number of Scythian proper, uh, proper names have an X element, polaxis, lipoxis, so forth. Uh, the overall effect was no doubt intended to be amusing, but the gullibility and simplicity of the Scythian would certainly have emphasized that the Athenians as a whole should not be afraid of the slave police and should waste of working their way around them. It frequently seems, such as in knights and assembly women and Acarnians, that the wielding of official coercive power by the Scythian slave police was resented by the Athenians, who may have thought it somehow against the natural order of things for barbarian slaves to be able to control things, such as the citizens' own paresia, the freedom to express opinions during the assemblies. When Euripides arrives at the scene of Nesilochus's torture in, um, in Thesmophoriatusai, he reacts by self-quoting himself. But the sentence, what barbarian land have we reached, an expression ruled used frequently in the Euripidean plays, also implies that the scene of barbarians torturing freeborn Athenians is an outlandish sight. In fact, the Scythian policemen were triply othered, their social condition as slaves, their barbarian origins, and their military position as archers instead of the citizen hoplites, who still con constituted the ideal image of the soldierly in, soldiery in popular perceptions. Indeed, in Lysistrata, we see the staunch Athenian women defeating the Scythian police force twice. And Lysistrata attributes the women's success to the fact that they are free Athenian women, not public slaves. That the Scythians are particularly uh, humiliated in the Thesmophoriatsusai and Lysistrata, which have been written in 411 and 410, has been suggested to reflect the Athenian population's increased frustration with the police force, which the oligarchic rule of the 400 clearly deployed eagerly and to the clear detriment of the citizens' feeling of paresia. The Athenians may have felt powerless to criticize the oligarchs directly, but it certainly seems that the Scythian police force was free of this and much resented. Now to the East, and the Asiatic people, so to speak. 
in the wake of the Persian Wars, the Athenian image assemblies regarding the Eastern peoples was starkly, starkly bifurcated. On the one hand, the Persians, or Medes, as they were frequently called, were a frightening, immensely powerful adversary whose oppressive presence in the Greek minds was frequently alleviated by making mockery out of them. Other groups in Asia Minor and the Eastern Mediterranean fringe, on the other hand, were described in ways that were much less obviously connected to fear and had, in many cases, important connections to the above-mentioned dynamics where slavery was a major influence on ethnographical knowledge. The fear of the Persians is present occasionally also in Aristophanic comedy, such as when in peace, Trugaios spreads this rumor that the sun and the moon are conspiring with the Persians, with the presumed motif that when the Greeks will be destroyed, these elemental divinities would become worshipped instead of the Olympians. This is a complex statement behind which stands not only the permanent Greek conviction that Persians were out to get them, fundamentally interested in dominating or destroying the mainland Greeks, but it is also informed by quite a bit of ethnically framed assumptions about the Persian religion. And in here, I feel like Aristophanes is again Herodotianizing. In Herodotus's histories, possibly already before it, Persians had been imagined as denying any kind of anthropomorphism in their religion and worshipping the natural elements visible around them, the sun, the moon, and the four elements. This is in Herodotus 1.131. Of course, part of the joke here is also to be able to laugh at the wild conspiracy theories that no doubt thrived in the feverish calculations of Athenians at the end of the first phase of the Peloponnesian War. The peace was, of course, staged in 421. Other well-known aspects of Persia included the prodigious speed of information and troop movements within the empire, helped along by the famous royal roads. Aristophanes uses this motif in the scene in Acarnians, where the credentials of the ambassador are called into question due to his claim of having passed through Persia with great difficulty and very slowly. So he clearly has not done his homework, and this exacerbates the Gaiopolis's suspicions of him. The Caiopolis is angered even more when the ambassador claims that in order to be taken seriously by the Persians, the envoys had to adapt their eating and drinking habits to the luxurious and voluminous style that was commonly thought to prevail in Persia, indeed very much in accordance with the already seen Hippocratic theory structure. In addition to the waste of public funds, um, this speaks of the deep-set Athenian fears about going Persian or Meditzein where the urban luxurious or Eastern lifestyles were thought to endanger the loyalties of Greeks. Even worse, the returning ambassador has brought with him a fellow surrounded by eunuchs with the grandiose title, the Eye of the King, which in fact was an actual honorific title in, uh, of an official in Persia, but whose name, his personal name, Seudartabas, begins with the Greek syllable associated with deceit and falsehood, Seud. Uh, the Athenian ambassadors try to misrepresent the sentences of the eye of the king, who speaks Persian or kind of Persian, but their concocted translations are found out when Pseudarotabas's final comment about loose arsed Greeks comes across actually clearly enough. So the language based humor in this setting is roughly the same as with Triballos in birds. The contest is to give meaning to non Greek speech, and like in birds, the only time when the barbarian says something vaguely understandable is when their answer is crucial. The difference between the eye of the king and Theribalos, as I think Timothy Long pointed out quite rightly, is that whereas the first one, the eye of the king, is a figure of authority, nonetheless, the latter, Theribalos, is so devoid of it that he manages to reduce even Poseidon and Heracles into laughingstocks. The unease about the loyalty of Greek ambassadors, uh, this is the so-called Darius base, uh, this unease about the loyalty of Greek ambassadors, so clearly legible in the scene of, in, in Acharnians, also points out the common topos in the Greek perceptions of envoys, especially if they had been away for many years, that it was quite conceivable that their loyalties had to be bought in uh, in the meanwhile, and they were in fact returning to their home police as double agents for the barbarians. Now, obviously, in terms of stereotypical perceptions of foreign lands, this danger was thought to be much more real in the case of wealthy and luxurious Persia than, for instance, savage and wintery Thrace. To the Greeks, Persia was a land where everything was big. 
And in order to exaggerate the tall tales told about the vast resources of the empire, Aristophanes inserts a scatological gag in Acarnians about the massive toilet excursions of the great king, which both in volume and duration sound more like military campaigns in Acarnians 80 to 86. But then again, he does say that the great king eats whole entire oxen, so maybe that leads to long toilet breaks. The emphasis overall in Acarnians is on the Kaiopolis being this perceptive canny everyman who sees through the bluster and grandiloquence of these potentially medizing ambassadors. Everyday objects could also be mentioned with ethnic tags. Uh, here, actually, we can see you can see the slippers of the attendant of the great king, and of course, this huge luxury and tall tiara of the great king. The Persian slippers mentioned in clouds and assembly women. The luxury of Persia felt in Athens through such things as fashionable outfits was frequently picked upon by the comedy writers, Aristophanes included. In Wasps, the Persian cloak called Kaunakes is a source of intergenerational bickering, with the older Philocleon being clearly alarmed by his son's expensive tastes and the attempt to make him wear the oriental garment, which he doesn't understand. The association of an upright type of tiara with the great king himself, here you can see it on Darius, allows Pistetyrus and Euelpides in the birds to argue that originally birds ruled the world and rooster ruled all the birds, since even nowadays the rooster is called Persian bird, and like the Persian king, it has got an upside, uh, upright coxcomb. Different peoples could also be associated with different professions, which seems to have been particularly common in the eastern and southern orbits. I would say that the northerners were commonly perhaps thought to be too rudimentary in their social organization to produce anything besides hunters and warriors and mercenaries, of course. Egyptians' prowess at building was, for instance, referred to in birds, where the construction of Cloud Cuckoo Land's huge perimeter wall is celebrated as not having needed Egyptian brick carriers, stonemasons, or builders. On the other hand, Egyptians were also commonly perceived as doing everything the other way around as the Greeks. Uh, this is a famous Herodotian trope again. And judging by a passage in Aristophanes' Thesmophoriatsusai, as well as Kratinos, a uh, fragment of Kratinos, the word Aegyptiadzein, to Egyptianize, was in the old comedy meant to act deceitfully. In the Athenian middle comedy, a few generations after Aristophanes, the topsy-turviness of Egypt and Egyptians was con uh, a continued talking point. And for instance, the comic poet Anaxandrides, to end this section with uh, somebody else outside and after Aristophanes, Anaxandrides, who was active about from about, about uh, 376 onwards, rattled off in his play Cities, a list of cultural opposites which, make, which would make it impossible for Egyptians and Greeks to be allies. Neither do our manners nor our laws agree with yours, they are wholly different. You adore an ox, I sacrifice the ox. Uh, you think eel is the mightiest god, I eat it as the best of fish. You don't eat pork, I love pork more than anything. You adore dogs, I beat them. Your priests need to be, uh, our priests, the Greek priests need to be most perfect of men. The Egyptians only use eunuch priests. The Egyptian, if he sees anything happening to a cat, will, you know, cry out loud, whereas the Greeks will first kill and then skin the cat. The Egyptians have great opinion on the shrew mouse, and the Greeks are completely indifferent to that. It's a very rich passage from Anaxandrides. Uh, but it's worth noting that as the 5th century old comedy gave way to middle comedy of the 4th century, and as the Athenian mini empire gave way to a period of much reduced power and the necessity of trying to gain allies from outside the Greek sphere, further away areas that had been in Aristophanes' time mentioned merely as areas of exotic produce or slightly ethnic curiosities were clearly, clearly debated as potential targets for diplomatic overtures, even though Anaxandrides' attitude belonged to a continuum with Aristophanes' earlier one. And both seem to have dragged their feet in acknowledging the realities, no doubt reflecting the very particular Athenian perceptions of their own exceptionality. One can idly wonder if the attitudes of comic poets could have ended up genuinely hindering the Athenian search for foreign allies, since every diplomatic decision like this still, like this, still needed to be approved by the assembly. <clears throat> So, to conclude, 
As the other talks in this series, I hope you will be able to attend them, will also discuss and make clear in terms of its targets, and there is no really going around this fact, the Aristophanic comedy presents us with a very mixed selection. It punches both up and down. Now, punching down is nowadays, of course, considered an, an unattractive feature of comedy by almost all sensible audiences. But it may be, I mean, this is of course not helpful, this sort of anachronism. It may be a good idea to nonetheless try to understand Aristophanes' mocking of the ethnically defined outsiders in the context of his own time. Firstly, it seems that old comedy gives us a fairly limpid window, not of course uncomplicated, but nonetheless quite clear, partly due to their uniformity and the correspondences with the imagery known from other genres and sources into the Athenian audience's commonly held notions about barbarians. Uh, the dangerous and wealthy power of Persia, though nonetheless treated with more respect and care than that of less powerful foreigners, then the brutish and venal Thracians and the violent and impulsive Scythians of Aristophanes' comedies did not represent the whole pool of stereotypes about these peoples. For instance, the fairly well-known motif of Scythian impotence, which we know from the Hippocratic airs, waters, and places, goes completely unmentioned, and indeed the opposite is present for reasons of plotting in Thesmoporeatsuzai. But all the elements that Aristophanes does include were recognizable parts of his audience's shared imagery and find comparisons from other texts. Secondly, the interests and the values of the wealthy established elite of Athens was necessarily important to Aristophanes as he would have depended on their sponsorship for the continuation of his career. Thus, although he occasionally mounts absolutely savage attacks towards influential upstarts and elites uh, alike, very often the underlying values of Aristophanes are surprisingly conservative. It barely needs pointing out, of course, that he never thought that barbarians could be the equals to Greeks or indeed that enslavement, especially of non-Greeks, could pose any ethical problems. Punching down at ethnic others and minorities was a fully available strategy to him, and he had no qualms uh, in making unrestrained use of it. In this sense, it is very noteworthy how Aristophanes' iconoclasm in terms of many other topics gives way to a wholly conventional set of stereotypes when ethnic others are being written off. Clearly, in his era, cultural relativism was practiced by a completely other side of Athenian discourse, such as the author of this logoi. The voice of old comedy, and here I quote Timothy Long, has been called, quote, bigoted and intolerant. And there is very little reason to call this into question. But the bigotry and intolerance were to a large degree features of its audience. And the reasons why Athens of Aristophanes' era the society that is much advertised nowadays as the cradle of Western democracy, which in itself is a remarkably recent emphasis, as Johanna Harning has very cogently argued. Why Athens of Aristophanes' era produced this kind of bigotry, the reasons are very revealing and very well worth studying. If in many of Aristophanes' plays, the broader dynamics stem from the moralizingly inflected conflict between the old ways and the new, the feeling of lessening or being threatened by lessening. The barbarians could be said to play a part in this, at least in the sense that the former confidence of ethnic others being separate from the police seems to have come under question. The new reduced Athens is implied by Aristophanes to depend on outsiders more than in the past. And the freedom of the citizens to move and to express their opinion is claimed to be under threat from uppity slaves, both private and public. In this sense, some of the Aristophanic references to barbarians could be seen as an anxious reaction to a world that was less clear in its ethnically framed divisions and where the world's multiplicity and complexity had begun to reveal the fault lines in the Periclean nativism of the Pentecost idea. And I thank you very much. I leave you with the references and further reading and invite any kinds of comment and questions. I thank you very, very much indeed. Thank you, Anthony. This was fascinating, uh, beautiful. On the topic that, that um, we often do have something to say, and at, at the same time, we of course uh, we are delighted to hear these little details at how the different different groups have have been uh, coined by Aristophanes in his own way. Thank you for joining us, and uh, have a beautiful uh, evening wherever you are. See you next time.
Thank you from me too. Have a lovely summer. Bye.